ഇന്നത്തെ ടോപ്പിക്ക് എക്യുമെനിക്കൽ മൂവ്മെന്റ് ടുഡേ എന്നുള്ളതാണ് എക്യുമെനിക്കൽ മൂവ്മെന്റ് എന്നുള്ളതിന് ഒരു ശരിയായ മലയാളം പോലും കിട്ടാൻ വലിയ പ്രയാസമാണ് ഇറ്റ്സ് എ കോൺസെപ്റ്റ് ഫോർ വിച്ച് ദർ ഇസ് നോ എക്സാക്ട് ട്രാൻസ്ലേഷൻ ഇൻ മലയാളം ഈവൺ ഇൻ ഇംഗ്ലീഷ് ഇറ്റ്സ് മീനിങ് ഇസ് നോട്ട് കംപ്ലീറ്റ്ലി ക്ലിയർ എക്യുമെനിക്കൽ ഇസ് എ ഗ്രീക്ക് വേർഡ് കമ്മിങ് ഫ്രം ഓൾക്കുമെനെ വിറ്റ് ഈസ് എ വേർഡ് വിച്ച് മീൻസ് ലിറ്ററലി ഇറ്റ് മീൻസ് ആധിവാസിത ദാറ്റ് വിച്ച് ഈസ് ഡ്വെൽഡ് ഇൻ എന്നേ അർത്ഥമുള്ളൂ എക്യുമെനെ എന്നുള്ള വാക്കിന് അതൊരു ടെക്നിക്കൽ വേർഡ് ആയിരുന്നു റോമൻ എംപയറില് റോമൻ എംപയറിന്റെ എല്ലാ ഭാഗങ്ങളിലുമുള്ള ആളുകളെ എല്ലാവരെയും കൂടെ എക്യുമെനെ എന്ന് പറയുമായിരുന്നു വേർഡ് എക്യുമെനെ ഡിഡ് നോട്ട് നെസസറലി മീൻ ദ ഹോൾ ഇൻഹാബിറ്റഡ് എയർ ബട്ട് ഓൺലി ദ ഹോൾ ഇൻഹാബിറ്റഡ് റോമൻ എംപയർ ബട്ട് എക്യുമെനിക്കൽ മൂവ്മെന്റ് is something which we have created in the 20th century and it has got at the moment two different meanings one is the strictly christian meaning namely a movement seeking the unity of all christians and their common ministry in the world that is one meaning the other meaning is moving towards the unity of all things not only all human beings but all things adinagathe ippure oru vaadu aalukale the larger ecumenism allengil greater ecumenism nu parayum adha by that they mean not only the unity of the church but also the unity of the religions അതിനെ ലാർജർ എക്യുമെനിസം എന്ന് പ്രത്യേകിച്ചും കത്തോലിക്ക സഭയിലും മറ്റു ചില സ്ഥലങ്ങളിലും ഒക്കെ ഉപയോഗിക്കുന്നുണ്ടെങ്കിലും ദി ട്രൂ മീനിങ് ഇസ് ദറ്റ് ദ ഹോൾ യൂണിവേഴ്സ് ഈസ് ടു ബി യുണൈറ്റഡ് എന്നുള്ളത് ലെറ്റ് മീ ജസ്റ്റ് ഫസ്റ്റ് സേ ദറ്റ് ഫോർ എ ക്രിസ്ത്യൻ ദ യൂണിറ്റി ഓഫ് ദ ചേർച്ച് ഇസ് നോട്ട് എ ഹോബി ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് എൻ ഓബ്ലിഗേഷൻ ബിക്കോസ് if you are united to christ and if other christians also are united to christ then you must all be one how can those who are united to the one christ be different and divided so it is part of the christian belief that the christian is united to christ which involves the obligation for all christians to be one unit united to christ the fundamental point is that christ has only one body he cannot have a separate body for the catholics the separate body for the orthodox and the separate body for the protestants or presbyterians or somebody he can have only one body and anybody who is incorporated into the body of christ must be in that body so the unity of the church is not an optional subject it is part of the faith of the christian if i am united to christ thereby i am united also to all christians but that's only one side the other side the larger side is if christ died for all human beings christ did not die just for christians he died for all human beings then true ecumenism in christ means a concern for all human beings and not just for the unity of the church unity of the church yes but in the context of the unity of humanity now from my personal point of view there are three dimensions of christ one 
Christ is united to the Christian in a particular way. Namely, he believes in Christ, he has been baptized into Jesus Christ, and therefore there is one level at which Christ and the Christians are related. But at another level, the humanity which Christ took was not a Christian humanity, certainly. I mean, the Blessed Virgin Mary was not a Christian and Jesus did not take a Christian body from Mary. If anything, it was a Jewish body, but it was a human body. And therefore, by virtue of the Incarnation, Christ is related to all humanity. And that's very important for me. It's important also because all human beings are created in Christ also, not only by the Incarnation, but even by virtue. Who is the creator of all human beings according to us? It is Christ who has created all human beings. And who is the one who at the end will unite all things in himself? Christ will unite all things in himself. And therefore, both by virtue of the Incarnation and by virtue of the creation and by virtue of the final fulfillment, Christ is related to the whole of humanity. His Incarnation is meaningful not just for Christians but for the whole of humanity. So there is one level where Christ with his body, the church, another level with Christ with humanity. And the third level in which all creation is to be reconciled in Christ Jesus. All creation has been created in Christ Jesus. All creation is to be reconciled in Christ Jesus. And the incarnation itself is a union of God not just with humanity but with this material time-space world. The world itself has been assumed by Christ. So I always think in these three dimensions of Christ, the church dimension or the body of Christ dimension, the humanity dimension and the universal dimension. So to me true ecumenism means all these three dimensions. It should not be limited just to the unity of the church. That's the first point I wanted to make. Now the second point I wanted to make is that ecumenism is not the same as the World Council of Churches. For some people ecumenism means simply the World Council of Churches, but ecumenism is a larger movement in which the World Council of Churches is only one of the privileged units. It has a special role, it may have a leading role, that was debated for a long time, the Roman Catholics would not agree that the World Council has a leading role. So finally the word that was agreed upon in the discussion between the Roman Catholics and the World Council was that the World Council of Churches is a privileged instrument of the ecumenical movement. It is a privileged instrument, not chief instrument, but a privileged instrument of the world comes of the ecumenical movement. And we must give the WCC the importance it deserves. But if you want to talk about the ecumenical movement, you must also talk about the Roman Catholic Church, which has its own ecumenical policy and ecumenical program, which is not the same as that of the World Council of Churches. Uh, thirdly, there is the what is known as the conservative evangelical churches, not the mainline Protestant churches, but the evangelical groups which are not necessarily members of the Presbyterian Church or the Methodist Church or the Anglican Church, they are also they also have a certain ecumenical movement now particularly. As you know, the number of sects, Protestant sects, in the world, nobody knows. In South Africa alone, there are 10,000 sects. And in the USA, more than that number. Because everybody starts the new sect. 
And now there is a movement which is beginning to sweep through these sets and saying we must not remain separate, we must find our own unity and then find our ecumenical approach to the World Council of Churches and to the Roman Catholic Church. So, if you want to talk about the Christian ecumenical movement, you must speak about the Roman Catholic ecumenical program as well as the conservative evangelical Roman Catholic pro the ecumenical program. Now, let me just give you a brief background, very brief, about how the World Council came to be formed in Amsterdam in 1948. The World Council is hardly 50 years old. In 1998 it will have its golden jubilee. It was formed only in 1948 and 1998 will be its jubilee and that jubilee anniversary will be held in Africa. In Zambia, is it? No, Zimbabwe. South Africa or Zambia? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe Zambia. I don't know. It's not final, but it will be in that region. That will be around 1998. Now, in this 50 years, much has happened. But before I speak about that, let me speak about what went before the formation of the World Council of Churches. Sometimes I think that we Indians were the leaders of the ecumenical movement because the formation of the Church of South India in 1947 was a year before the formation of the World Council of Churches. And the formation of the Church of South India is a new kind of departure in which churches of an episcopal nature like the Anglican Church and a non-episcopal nature like uh, Presbyterians, Methodists, Congregationalists and so on came together in what was then believed to be the model for church unity. Now it is not believed to be the model. But in 1947, when that happened, there was a lot of anticipation. We had some very good church leaders and uh, they almost uh, gave hope to the West that it is possible for Protestant churches at least to come together on the Church of South India plan. As you know, the Church of South India was formed by first the, that, at that time it was the Church of India, Burma and Ceylon. One church during the British days, India, Burma and Ceylon. But out of the whole Anglican Church, only four dioceses joined the uh, new CSI. The four dioceses were Madras, Tirunelveli, Travancore, Cochin and Dornakan. Only these four dioceses of the Anglican Church joined with the Methodist Church. Its South Indian province also joined the CSI and then what had already been formed as the SIUC, the South India United Church. That had already been formed in 1908 and it was a merger of uh, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, that's reformed in the beginning, as I use it. Then the Basel Mission people joined it and uh, it, uh, it was also an important meeting. In 1919, it was this SIUZ which convened a conference of a uh, very important conference in Frank Viva. Uh, when the mission bodies were fighting each other and competing with each other, some of the Indian leaders got together. Actually, 31 Indian leaders, one American and one Englishman. That was unusual for those days when we were under British rule to have the British leaders of the church sort of kept out. The American leaders also kept out only those who were sympathetic were drawn in 
and a meeting was held in Tranquibar, which was the one that first made an appeal saying that all Christians should be united. Very interesting, early appeal, as early as 1919. Now, on the basis of that 1919 appeal, the Lambeth Conference of the Anglicans <coughs> made another appeal, which was an appeal to all Christian peoples to be united. Let me try to tell you what is behind all this. You see, in 1918 the First World War ended and in Europe the League of Nations was born and that became the model for the churches. The churches also wanted to have a League of Churches. So that in 1920 Ecumenical Patriarch issued an encyclical from Constantinople saying we should form a League of Churches. Like the League of Nations, there should be a League of Churches. It was in 1920. So in 1920 we had uh, already the idea of the World Council of Churches and even the word itself began to be used. But if you ask me how the actual World Council was formed, there are four movements which merge together to form the WCC and three movements which did not join but help put it to unite. Interesting. The three which helped were the World Student Christian Federation, the YMCA, the YWCA. They didn't join the World Council, but the three were helping all the time for the churches to come together without themselves as uh, non-church organizations. They were helping it. And the WSCF played a major role in bringing the churches together, the first General Secretary, Dr. Vizet Hoop, was the General Secretary of the World Student Christian Federation. You know what the WSCF is. It was composed of all the SCFs, Student Christian Movements of the World. And that body played a major role. But the four movements which merged in the World Council at different periods were, first, Life and Work Movement, Two, faith and order movement, three, missionary movement, and four, Sunday school movement. You may not immediately see that, but I will explain it to you. Now, already in 1910, the first world missionary conference was held. That was the time when they first began talking about something like the World Council of Churches. And Edinburgh, 1910, World Missionary Conference. That conference was presided over by a well-known ecumenist called John R. Mott. He was also the leader of the YMCA, but he was also the president of the 1910 World Conference on the Missions of the World. It was a major conference in Edinburgh, 1,200 delegates, 160 mission boards were present there. That was the beginning of the ecumenical movement, you can say, because already at that time the missionaries were saying, how can we preach the gospel to the pagans of the world when we ourselves are disunited? So it was the, the missionary situation which pushed on them the desire to unite. And they at that time created the International Missionary Council, which has held so many mission conferences all through the period. And even now, such things are being organized by the World Council. This body joined the World Council only in 1961. At the New Delhi Assembly, the International Missionary Council became an integral part of the World Council of Churches, only in 61. In 48, they said, we want to retain our missionary independence. We don't want to be under the churches. That was the point of view in 48. We want to retain our independence as missionary societies, as distinct from the churches which are uniting in 48. But 
In 61 they changed that policy and they became an integral part of the World Council in uh, New Delhi, where I was present. The other movement, which is very important, is the Faith and Order movement, which began around 1927. The Faith and Order movement is uh, met in Switzerland in 1927. Amazing, 90 different churches were represented officially. It was the first official church representative gathering. The first Lausanne conference on faith and order, when 90 churches, almost all except three main groups, Roman Catholic Church did not participate in Lausanne. And 1937, the Evangelical Church of Germany did not participate because Nazism was already in power and they did not allow the, the German church to participate in the first faith and order conference. And then some Baptists also did not come to Lausanne because the Baptists said we are not churches, that is a meeting of churches, we won't go to the churches. For us, each local congregation is an independent unit. That's what most Baptists still say. They have no Baptist church as a whole, each parish is a church and no body can act on behalf of all the parishes. So those were the people who were not present in Lausanne and in Lausanne they discussed uh, what divides us, what unites us. They were all clear that what unites them is the faith in Jesus Christ. At that time the ecumenical patriarch was Germanos of Fiat era, who later became ecumenical patriarch, very distinguished scholar and a great ecumenist. Unlike later Greek bishops, very open-minded man, however, very conservatively orthodox. So he made a speech which created the problem, in which he said, unless all the churches of the world accept the seven ecumenical councils and the seven sacraments, there cannot be any unity. And the Quakers stood up and said, we accept no ecumenical councils, we accept no sacraments. We have no sacraments and no councils. And so how can we be united? That was the kind of tension that existed already at the time of Lausanne. The Greeks demanding that everybody accept their way of doing things. And people like the Quakers saying, no way. The second conference, Faith and Order, was 1937. That was the time when Hitlerism was really coming up. And you remember 1937, our Catholicos, Vasilios Givergis II, went to Edinburgh and made a very big impression. I mean, his personality, his uh, holiness, made a great impact on the Western people in 1937 at the Edinburgh Faith and Order Conference. There they took a little more uh, conciliatory line. They didn't talk about seven sacraments and seven councils, but they took up issues like grace. Uh, that's a theological debate among the Protestants at that time, whether everything is done by the grace of God or we also have to cooperate in our salvation and so on. That issue they talked about because they thought that was where the difference was. Secondly, they said uh, the word of God, scriptures. Are we disagreeing on the scriptures? That was the question that was asked and there was a lot of disagreement. And third issue, strangely enough, in Edinburgh was the communion of saints. And on this there was great disagreement already at that time. Communion of Saints includes prayer for the departed and prayer to the saints. On that issue, great disagreements began to surface. And then finally, when you come to the ministry and the sacraments, there was even more disagreement in Edinburgh. Edinburgh saw that the range of difference was so wide that they still decided that we must continue our unity in life and worship so that 
by the grace of god these differences can be overcome it's that faith in the order conference which then united with the other movement called the life and work conference i don't know if you have heard about life and work conference this began actually during the first world war already the british and the european the, the germans were fighting each other and so some of the neutral countries said why should christian countries fight each other let all the christians in the neutral countries come together to see if we can create some kind of a unity in the world that was the beginning of the life and work movement a great swedish archbishop called nathan söderblom uh, who was archbishop of uppsala was the great leader he was a very learned man very pious man and he was the one who was saying that the english and the germans fight we are neutral countries sweden he is from sweden he said let's all the christians in the neutral countries unite to offset this conflict between two christian powers uh in uh, already before that there was a an appeal in 1914 at the beginning of the world war already the christian leaders were already appealing for unity and in 1917 uh there was an appeal by nathan soderblom again to all christians and finally when it came to 1925 the stockholm conference was an important conference there were mainly the archbishop of sweden the archbishop of canterbury and the ecumenical patriarch representative and one american those were the four presidents of this meeting at that time the orthodox was very much involved because germanus of fiatura was already in power and uh, germanus was not patriarch of constantinople but he was bishop of london and he was deputed by the ecumenical patriarch to take part in this stockholm 1925 as a result of that it became a really a movement and in 1937 it's a very interesting meeting on life and work called church community and state what they were discussing at that time is how can the church become influential in society in international relations and in economics this was their concern already in 1937 the oxford conference and was the time when the decision was made to constitute a world council of churches by bringing the life and work movement and the faith and the order movement together the same 1937 in edinburgh when oxford was having the life and work conference across the border in scotland in edinburgh the other faith and order conference was being held in 1937 now between these two conferences they made a decision the decision was to form the world council of churches but there was no implementation scheme in 1937 but already in edinburgh there were tensions uh especially the churches of the reformation said we are not going to accept the episcopate for the sake of unity that was the big contention and the anglican saying if you don't accept the episcopate there is no unity it is no longer the seven councils and the seven sacraments but the episcopate which became the stumbling block when 1937 they decided to float a world council of churches and the orthodox also were at that time siding with the anglicans in insisting on the episcopate anyway in 
they made another decision to hold another conference in 1938. And 38 made a decision and set up a committee to start the World Council of Churches. But by 38, the war situation is developing. Tension is developing between Germany and England and therefore the thing was delayed until the war was over. So the decision was made in 1938 and a committee was formed called the World Council of Churches in formation. But the actual uh, birth of the World Council took place only in 1948 in Amsterdam and at that time uh, the General Secretary, first General Secretary was the man who was the head of the student movement and he was a very powerful force in creating the World Council and in Amsterdam it happened. Now that's only three movements, life and work, faith and order and international missionary council. The fourth movement as I said is the Sunday school movement. It's a very interesting movement, the Sunday school movement. Uh, you know how it started. Those of you who are from the press would be interested to know it was a journalist who started the Sunday school. And what he did was he went to the slums around Gloucester and collected all the illiterate children of the poor people and began teaching them both literacy and the catechism. It was a literacy campaign. Sunday school in the beginning was actually a literacy campaign but because you were teaching poor people the teachers thought that they need a little bit of catechism also. So they were taught literacy and catechism. This is already 1780. Now by the time uh, 30 years, 40 years pass, education begins to spread in Europe. Until then education was very low percentage. People were illiterate. And the Sunday school was campaigning for literacy. But once the governments took over the literacy campaign, the Sunday schools didn't have to do that part. They specialized in the religious teaching. And this man, uh, Robert Wakes, the journalist, he used his newspaper to promote Sunday schools. And it was a very, very widely copied. America, Germans, everybody started Sunday schools. And in 1907, they started a special college to train Sunday school teachers, which is still there, Selly Oak, Birmingham, where some of our people have gone to study. That college was started to train Sunday school teachers. Now, this movement of Sunday schools grew so widely that uh, in this century, 20th century, the World Sunday School Union became a large body. Finally, they said Sunday school means only small children. That's not enough. We must think also about the Christian education of the adults. So they began something called the World Council of Christian Education. They were the ones who were mostly concerned about children's issues. And the World Council did not pick up children's issues mainly because the WCCE, the World Council of Christian Education was existing, therefore they said we don't have to do anything with children. And then in my time when I was in the World Council, we were asked to negotiate with this WCCE and I led the negotiations for their merger with the WCC in 1965. So 65, these four organizations have come together to form the World Council of Churches. And in the 60s, we used to have regular meetings of the World YMCA, YWCA, World Council of Churches, World Student Christian Federation, and the World Council of Christian Education. These five bodies used to meet regularly. I was the permanent chairman of that body, keeping all these five together. Now I think that has sort of broken off. Now, 
Let me say something about what has happened to the WCC since 1948. When it started in 1948, it was mainly a transatlantic organization. That means most of the Christian churches were from both sides of the Atlantic Ocean, especially the North Atlantic. That means European and American churches. In India, of course, our church was a founder member, but most of the other churches had not been formed. And most of Asia and Africa, the churches had not become independent because the countries were not independent. So at the time when the World Council was formed, it was very much a transatlantic, North American, European American body. And all the other Asian African groups were related to mission boards. They were not autonomous, except the Church of South India had become autonomous by that time. Now, this picture changed very quickly. And one of the biggest changes that took place in the World Council was in the period from 1947 when we became independent, 49 China becomes independent, and then so many independent countries, and each of these independent countries have got independent Protestant churches. And they all come into the fellowship of the World Council. Therefore, the World Council is transformed from being a white transatlantic body primarily to become a genuinely international body. It is a major change. And the climax of that change came by 1961. In 61, both the International Missionary Council came in and a large number of Asian African independent churches came in. And in 1961 also a major change took place for the World Council. When the World Council was founded, there were a few Orthodox churches among the founding members. The Syrian Orthodox Church was a founding member, uh, the Egyptian Church was a founding member, the Ethiopian Church was a founding member, the Armenian Church, not at the beginning, but they came in later, and uh, the Greeks were members, but all the Orthodox Churches behind the Iron Curtain were not members. Oh, sorry. What happened was, this is one of the... interesting episodes. In 1948, Vesatruk, Dr. Vesatruk wrote to all the churches that he could get addresses of, asking, inviting them all to become members. Most of the Oriental Orthodox churches responded positively, except the Syrian Orthodox. 